So I'm going to, I'm going to, he's going to meet me here tomorrow at 11 and, and he's going to, and I'm going to kind of interview with him and we're going to talk about a bunch of things. So Amen. you pray that goes well. And if he's not saved, you pray that he gets saved tomorrow. Amen. Amen. And that he hears the gospel. And, but I, I think he, he might be, I, I, I think that he is, but I don't know. But anyway, even so he needs to be in a good church if he's not in one. Amen. That's so that's right. another thing we'll talk about. Uh, but uh, we'll find out kind of uh, where he's sitting at, but I'm going to, his name's Kurt. And uh, so pray for that tomorrow. He'll be here at 11. Uh, at all? I haven't. I saw him a few weeks ago, uh, that young man. He's still listening. I think that kid's going to get saved. I think, he, I think he is. When we see him at this event or out at about, we need to talk to him. Amen. You know, that kid, his dad owns the, the pizza shop downtown. I have a job interview tomorrow. Amen. Like yep. Absolutely. Amen. 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 Wow. Sounds good. We'll be praying for that. Brother Paul, you had your hand up? Are we, are we okay for him? Yep, absolutely we will pray for that, Brother Aaron. And uh, amen. And uh, exciting times. Amen. Always something going on. Acts chapter 17. We better get moving here. It's, it is exciting to follow the Apostle Paul and his life through the scriptures and, and his ministry and to find out what he did and how he operated uh, under the inspiration of the Spirit. You can see that he's a man just like you and I and uh, that uh, he had his trials and his challenges and everything else that he went through and, and uh, had his helpers along the way just like we all do and just like pastors do and, and others that are in the ministry and, and brothers and sisters in Christ, how we... We all need one another. And Acts chapter 17, verse number 15, and they, that, and they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So that's where we're going to park at tonight in those two verses. And we're going to talk about that, what Paul saw there. And, and we're not even going to get to the, to the really meaty parts. I guess it all is really, but the real meaty parts is, are coming when, when Paul gives his famous discourse on Mars Hill, which happened to be in a lot of the, in the eyes of, I guess, the world and the eyes of, uh, of everything else that Paul accomplished, very small results from that. Uh, and we'll talk about why and what happened with that and everything. But, uh, but anyway, his discourse was, was wonderful, and it, it was biblical, and it was timely, and it really explained a lot. And it set, I think it set the course for his ministry to the Gentiles from there on out, because Paul is in the middle. Well, let's pray, and I'll get to it here. Father, Lord, thank you. Uh, we praise your name for all your goodness to us in the name of Jesus Christ, and we just pray for the Holy Ghost of God to be poured out upon us tonight. One or two be here that are not saved, Lord, that they'd come to Christ as their Lord and Savior. They'd be born again by the Spirit of God, have their sins forgiven. And those that are your saints, Father, may this word tonight strengthen their hearts. Encourage them to continue on, to fight the good fight of faith and to lay hold on eternal life and to be encouraged for the rest of the week to fight on, Lord. Please fill your, spirit, fill your people with your spirit. Fill your people with your zeal and your power and your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So they conducted Paul. They brought him unto Athens. Okay, so here's what happened. In Berea, uh, the, in the Bereans there, uh, they were more noble, right? The church was built there, or the church was started there. Many people were saved of all walks of life, devout women, uh, wealthy people, poor people, Jews and Gentiles, all coming to Christ, and that church came together, right? And that church was formed there, but then the Jews heard about it over in Thessalonica. And man, those Jews, I'll tell you what, they had some good recon, man. They knew, they knew how to find Paul, and they knew where he was. They'd go send for him, or they'd go send out and find out. And they heard about Paul being there, and then they sent a gang of people after Paul that stirred up the city of Berea right there. And then Paul... Uh, the, the Bereans there said, look, Paul, you got to go. All right, you got to get out of here. 
Now you think Paul, Paul's the apostle. He doesn't have to listen to them. No, but it's not wrong for, for a preacher to take advice, amen, especially when it's good advice. And they said, Paul, you got to go. They're going to kill you. We got to get you out of here. You're the main guy they're after. And if they can get a hold of you, they're going to kill you. So what did they do? They conducted him on his way and got him out of there. So Paul left Timothy and Silas there. He leaves them there uh, to uh, help the church, right, to continue on there and to do some things there. And Paul is waiting in Athens alone, right? Paul is alone in Athens. They conduct him there. Uh, what, I, what that means by conducted, it's kind of like a... Like they delivered him there to some, to, to some people that would take care of him. That he wouldn't be alone by himself. Some friends, some acquaintances, some people they knew. And they got him there to safety. Right? So he could, and Paul, so he, in comes Paul. Now I want you to understand what's going on here. Paul walks into this city of Athens. Now you have to understand, Paul trained at the feet of Gamaliel, right? So, so Paul was not an unrefined man. In that sense, Paul understood fine art. He understood uh, art and culture. And he, I mean, he was a very well educated man. So he kind of he understood all that. But he walks into Athens. You have to understand, Paul is a saved Jew. Now, Jews are already trained to hate idolatry, right? They look at, 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 at the worshiping of idols and things of that nature and building coliseums and, uh, that, that are full of, uh, or, and building temples and, and beautiful structures that are full of worship to false gods and everything else. And he looks at that and he, you know, you're going to find his reaction. But Paul is like, he's hanging out there and, uh, you know, he looks at the city and he gets there. And the first thing Paul does when he gets there to make a long story short, then I'll make it longer. Here's what he does. He gets there and he goes, wait, before you go back to Berea, get Timothy, get Silas, and get them here now. Why? Because he started to see that he's in the biggest city of idolatry he has ever seen in his life. And he walks along, and we're going to talk about the structures and the things that he saw. But he walks along, and he's seeing all these things. And his, his eyes, and he's seeing the people, and he's watching them, and how they're acting, and how they're behaving, and what they're doing. But what did he see? What, what really got him? That's really what we need to look at first, kind of understand what Paul saw. Get an understanding. See, there's, there's some geographical background to this. There's also some historical background, and, and obviously we have the philosophical background that's there too because there's great philosophy that's involved with that. So there, there's a lot of philo philo philosophers that are involved with that. The great philosophers of the world came from this city. I mean, you got to understand what Paul's walking into. You know, some speculate that when it says here, it says, and they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens. Now, when you look at before that what they said, that's verse 15. In 14, it says, and then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. So they left it very vague. They didn't tell anybody where. They said, oh, Paul, he went to the sea. They weren't going to tell him. They weren't going to let it spread abroad where Paul was, right? Um, the sea could take you anywhere. As soon as he got on the sea, he would be anywhere. And that's where they left it. You know, you don't, did you know you don't have to tell your enemies everything? You, you really don't have to. You don't, you don't have to tell people everything either. You know, you don't always have to be specific. It's not a sin for you not to tell everybody everything. Amen. Right? Now, obviously, we're not going to lie to people. We're not to do that. We're not to, but you don't have to tell everybody everything. You don't have to. Paul was very careful. His, the people that conducted him, he didn't tell them specifically. Paul's like, well, I'm a warrior. I'll tell them where I'm at, and they can come get me. No. Paul was wise as a serpent. Right? The people that were conducting Paul were wise. They're like, eh, we're not going to tell them where we're taking him. We're just getting him out of here. Right? Sometimes it's important that you don't say too much when in situations like that. It's not a sin to be wise. You don't have to telegraph every move, right? So we come to this, this city. Um, and in this city right here, what, there's a few things going on. 
background wise. Paul writes the epistle to the Thessalonians from Athens. This is where he writes his epistle to the Thessalonians. He writes it there, and then, then Timothy is going to deliver that to Thessalonica. He's going to end up going back there, and he's going to take that, that letter to them, and he's going to read it in their churches, right? Turn to 1 Thessalonians 5. Let's go there. See, now this is, is this stuff going to start making sense a little bit, you think? Amen. When you start reading this, you say, well, why, why is this in there? Well, this is why. This, this explains to you why that's in there, why he told us this. See, you can trace this down. He says here, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. Where? In Thessalonica. Paul's writing it there. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 1 through 3. We're going to read that, then you're going to get a little more context. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. And sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the, in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. So Paul sends Timothy with this letter back to Thessalonica to comfort them and to establish them in the faith. He cared about those churches. He cared about the work that he had done there and he didn't want it to be done in vain, right? He, he, was, he was concerned for them. He was very concerned. That no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Now, there's an aspect of the ministry here, too, that sometimes as pastors we forget. Uh, and that is that, you know, Paul was concerned that the people that followed him, that were in his churches, that were, part of, that were members of the churches that he was part of, that they didn't get overly concerned for him. That they weren't worried about him. You know, sometimes when you see pastors go through some hard times, you get a little concerned. You, you look at it like, oh, man, are they going to be okay? You know, so Paul made sure that he, that he explained to them, listen, the things that have befell me, they've fallen out rather for the gospel's sake. So just remember, I'm going to be, I'm going to be fine no matter if I'm in prison or if I'm free. I'm going to be fine because Christ has me. And these afflictions, remember I told you when I was with you that we were appointed under these afflictions, that they should come to pass. So he's trying to comfort them. There's an aspect of a shepherd that they, that they have to remember to comfort the flock because they could get disturbed by things that happen. Um, that's why one of the things, one of the things I, I think that God has put on my heart especially is that that I, and I, I didn't think about all the applications for this, but that I got to, whatever I do, I try to do as quickly as I can and get myself established as like moving. If I'm going to move or if I'm going to sell my house, it's not good for me to stay too long in transition. And God knows that. And by the way, I told people three or four years ago that when I sell my house, God's going to give me a house right away. Amen. And he did just that. And, I told, and the reason for that is that God knew that I could not be in transition like that. Yep. The personality that I have, the type of ministry that I have, the things that I do, that it wasn't good for me to do that. Yep. I needed to be stabilized. I needed to be in a place, set in, and that's the way that it needed to be. God knew that, right? Right? God knew that. He knew that's the way that it had to be. Amen. Now, your trial may be different than that, right? It may not be the same. I'll, I have other ones. <laughs> but in that case, right, God knew that I couldn't do that. I had to be there. I, as a pastor, I have to be careful about having too many doors opened. They have to be shut. It's the way my mind works also and things like that. Too many open, nope, I got to have it shut. If I have a vehicle that's not working right, that's going to that, that's continue to do that, nope, I'm done with it. I'm done. I, I can't do that. I can't do that very long. Some people can do those things. I can't. I know what it does to me. It distracts me. I don't want to be distracted. I want to be settled in where I'm at and get on with the ministry. Amen. Because that's what God's called me to do. So God has always enabled me and allowed me to be able to do that. And I, I went a long transition with this. But anyway, because it also comforts you to know that I'm stable. I'm set. I'm where I'm going to be. I'm, I'm focused on what I have to do. Right? I don't need to be, so to speak, out of the saddle too long. I need to be in the saddle and moving and, and, and getting done what needs to be done. Right? Amen? Look at the timing. 
We got our busiest time of the year is coming up. August, September, October, right? Those three months are the busiest preaching months of our entire year right there. Amen. They are. And get ready. Get ready. I got to get that stinking cutter ordered tonight, man. So remind me before you leave, get that ordered. I'll, it's one click, right? What's that? Yes, I got to get that. We got to get that footage over to that lawyer, too, also. Uh, we got to get that done because that's coming up quicker than, than what we think. But we have the busiest time. This is where we hand out. This is where we preach to hundreds of thousands of people, right? This is where we hand out 25, 30,000 tracks, I, I mean, right? So we're heading into it. Amen? So God knew that, and he got me stable before then. Amen? And I appreciate that. I'm very thankful for that. And I believe that. I believe that's what the Lord did for a reason. So it's important that that you're not, that that doesn't, too much instability in a leader can cause, or too much, if people have fear of that, it can cause, you know, um, them to be moved from faithfulness. So you have to, they have to see that their pastor is settled as well. And Paul wanted them to know that though he's going through these afflictions that God had him, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as, as it has came to pass. And you know, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Paul was concerned for them, so he sent Timothy with that letter and said, go check on him. Paul was like concerned for them that, man, they heard about him and man, they just, maybe they, maybe they all left, <laughs> right? He was a little worried about that. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Amen. You know, I, I can honestly tell you through all the afflictions and things that the Lord has brought me through that he doeth all things well. Amen. God, God is right no matter what. God's right. Right. I remember right before one of the greatest trials in my life four years ago with Brother Aaron, I was sitting in the same room and I looked at him and I said, whatever happens, I said, the Lord, Jesus is worth it all. He's worth it. Yeah, you did ask me. And the Lord showed me again and again. I was beat down that day. <laughs> But you know what? The Lamb of God deserves to receive the reward of his sufferings. Amen. Amen. We need to remember that. Number two, what was the city of Athens like? What was it like? It was such a magnificent city, no doubt, where Paul would have had one of his most notable discourses and disputations against many groups, which we'll talk about. We'll see the many groups that that Paul actually dealt with there at the time as he's planting, you know, uh, churches all along the way. Then he comes to Athens. Now I'm going to read you some things. Thomas Walker said this about Athens. He said, the capital of, uh, of Attica and it was Athens and the most celebrated city of, the, of ancient Greece. It was the home of, of classical literature and art, and it gloried in a long past of political and intellectual fame. Under the Romans, it was included in the province of Achaia, of which Corinth was the capital. Athens was still, however, the intellectual center and was the university city of the Roman world. It was the metropolis of Greek mythology. Its importance as a religious and philosophical center cannot be overstated. So, such a huge worldly, it reminds me of Northfield in that sense, uh, just a huge worldly atmosphere, intellectual, philosophical place. Right, Satan's stronghold. Athens was the chief and most celebrated city of ancient Greece. It was the city of the famous philosophers, Aristotle, Plato. No, not Plato, like, you know, some not, not, the, not, the, not Plato, but Plato. Socrates, Zeno, Epicurus, 
many others. It was the major seat of learning and art in Paul's day. Very sophisticated, always talking about something, always philosophizing about something, right? Always running around talking about uh, something new, which we'll get to in a little while. It, yeah, progressive, that's right. It got its name from the prominence given to the worship of the goddess Athena, which we're going to talk about Athena a little bit tonight. And why is that? You say, well, we don't need to learn about that. Well, not, you don't have to, but it's a, if you want to understand what Paul was coming up against, a little explanation of that goddess that ruled that area, that statue that, that, that was, uh, was a visual manifestation of the goddess that they worship, which is nothing more than Satan. Right, the temple, that's right. The temple of Athena, that's right. And all of the buildings, all of the grand buildings that were there and everything. It, it, it'll help you understand it. She was also known as Minerva in, the, in Roman mythology. The city was totally given over to idolatry in the days of Paul. It was said that there were more statues in Athens than all the rest of Greece. You know what else was said about it? There were more gods in Athens than men. There were estimated to be 10,000 men in Athens, and there were th over 30,000 public gods in Athens. So imagine you're the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles, and you walk into that city, and you're walking on those streets, and you see 30,000 statues of gods that they worshipped. I mean, they had gods for everything, kind of like India. Yep. Right? Same as India. Right? Same as India. It's located about three miles from the sea. The city features four hills. Now, Paul had to go to Aeropagus, which was called Mars Hill. There was a council going to be set up there, and Paul's going to deal with that, uh, and we'll talk about that next week. It was a place where the court of Athens met. And Paul had to go on trial. Of course, you know any preacher that goes anywhere preaching the gospel, anywhere like that, he's going to be on trial. They're, they're, they're going to put him on trial somewhere. The authorities are going to come in somewhere. Right? In my estimation, what I believe is that that devil or that false goddess, Athena, just another devil or fallen angel or something, right, is what ruled over that city. Kind of like when you go to Washington, D.C. and other places and they got pagan statues up everywhere. And, and their pagan gods, their Greek and Roman gods that they have up, and they, they have them up everywhere, right? In the name of art. Boy, you can get away with a lot of stuff in the name of art, can't you? Boy, you can't raise your children according to the scriptures sometimes in the name of art, but these perverts can molest children, and they can put naked statues of children all over the place in the name of art, can't they? Yep. How about that? Is that a little too straightforward? Right? And by the way, who's dumb enough to believe that a Roman Catholic church that runs around having half-naked sta or naked statues of children and babies and women and all kinds of other, and guys and all kinds of other weird stuff, that they ain't perverts, that they're not doing something else. That's like saying the guy that watches pornography is safe to be around your kids. Right? right? Am I right? Who's with me? Who's still a Baptist tonight that believes that? That it believes Rome's that old whore on the hill? That's right. Old bunch of perverts up there. Always some nasty old gross white dude up there running a pedophile ring up there. Yep. Stinking nasty perverts. And then they're priests and you talk to them out on the street. Bunch of nasty fools. Then they send another one in to cover up something. Then they send the Jesuits in in their monkey outfits to cover up for their for their stuff and for their sins and what they've done. Come on. Too much truth. This is, this is, I mean, this is, you're going to see it tonight. This is the same. This is what's going on right here. Same thing. Welcome to America. Welcome to Athens. Come on. You know, we'll talk about the philosophers that were there a little bit later, but you know, Paul warns about the philosophies of men. The, you got to be careful about, in the name of art, what people get away with and what they do. Right? These people were slaves to their own intellect. Look at the philosophers. Look how they had nothing better to do with their time than worship their own intellect. They sat around and worshiped their own, own intellect, their own minds. 
think of this story of the goddess Athena. And I'm going to show you that. I'm, I'm going to read a little bit of that to you here, just so you understand. Why? Because you're going to understand the spirit that was there and what these people did. Like, first of all, I mean, if you're seriously a guy and, and you're in a city and the whole city is, it worships a goddess, a woman, I mean, first of all, I question your manhood anyway. All right? I, I just do, plain and simple. I don't, it, it's, like, it's, like, it's like a guy sitting under a female preacher. Like, I don't even, I, I, I don't even see how you, you can claim to be a man. Or worse, a guy that's married to a female preacher. Right. That guy definitely must be a eunuch or something. Because I'm telling you, because it makes no sense at all how that guy could be that way. How could you go home with somebody that screamed and hollered like that and, and usurped authority and did that? Like, how could you even feel like, well, like, what would be the point to be married to her? Like, what would be the point? Right? right? But see, that, that's because that Jezebel spirit, that spirit rules over them. Just like this city. And you'll see the chaos in Athens because of it. In that sense, organized chaos. Athena was said to be the goddess of battle strategy and wisdom. Identified in the Roman mythology as the goddess Minerva, she was always accompanied by her owl and the goddess of victory, Nike. Who'd have thought? Also known as Pallas Athena, she wore a breastplate made out of goat skin called Aegis, which was given to her by her father, Zeus. She had many names that explain her. Some of her names are Helmet Head. <laughs> <laughs> Athena the wise and other. Athena was an armed warrior goddess. The Parthenian at Athens was her most famous shrine. So that whole Parthenian, that whole structure was made in honor to her. Think about that. She never had a true lover or someone to hug and hold her. <laughs> all she had was her loving mother, her caring father, and most of all her brothers and sisters. Like we care. Anyway, uh, but in, in the Odyssey where Athena assists Odysseus, whatever. Anyway, so I'll go on and on and on. I'm not going to read all this to you. Athena's mother was Metis. Uh, Metis warned Zeus that if she bore him a boy child, the child would be greater than him. Listen to this. Listen to how stupid mythology is. Okay, you ready? Zeus swallowed her and started having a terrible headache. You shouldn't swallow people. You'll get a headache. I don't think you should swallow people. You deserve to get a headache. Right? So Zeus swallowed her and started having a terrible headache. Then his head, <laughs> then his head split open by an axe from help from Hephaestus. Nice guy. I mean, I'd have hit the guy in the head with an axe too, probably. It's <laughs> a weird story. Suddenly, Athena came out of his head. Athena came out fully grown with her symbols, the Aegis and famous helmet of Athena. Athena is much like her brother Ares. They are both rulers of war, but she is more of the strategy and quick thinking. Anyway, so Athens is named after Athena for memory of her. She has proved her skills for craft, for making cloth. Once a young maid named a uh, Arachnid, and she turned her into a spider because she made better cloth than her, and she got mad. So Athena got jealous one day, and this lady named Arachne was walking around, and she said, well, I could make better gold. I could make better stuff than, than Athena can. So Athena heard about it, got mad, came down, and turned her into a spider. And that's where you get the name Arachnid. I don't know. Anyway, that's what they say. Uh, right? So anyway, I'm just reading it. I didn't make it up. You see why Paul looked at all of it and said, you're all too superstitious. Yep. <laughs> We're going to get to that next week. That's going to be fun. Yeah, that's going to that's be really fun. Yeah. Anyway, so now think of Paul and think of what he said in Corinthians when he talks about the wisdom of this world and the philosophies of men and all this other stuff. And Paul talks about the wisdom of God because Paul writes that letter uh, to the Corinthians. And I mean, that's after Athens, after he had just dealt with the biggest bunch of idolaters he had ever seen in his life everywhere, just surrounded by it. And the foolishness and the nonsense of it all just bothered him so much. Right? It was supposed to be the most beautiful temple that Parthenian, Parthenon, excuse me, uh, the most beautiful temple in the world at the time. 
when the Roman Empire was filled with glorious pagan temples. I mean, they made these huge monstrosities, these structures. They had a 70-foot high statue of Athena, was visible to ships a long distance away. Right? Kind of. What? You mean like, you mean like the Statue of Liberty? Yeah. No, that's not pagan, is it? The Statue of Liberia. Yeah, no, the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, this, is that who that is? Yeah. Oh, I always thought it was Diana. Well, Pick one. It doesn't matter. Like right? It. It's the androgynous God. Yeah. And then what's it, what makes it even better is when you're a fundamental Baptist and you're sitting at a meeting and they sing the Statue of Liberty song. <laughs> that oh, just, that, 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 be Paul, that one, that one, uh, that one warms your heart right there. Yeah. And when they when they sing that when they, you never heard the Statue of Liberty song, you've heard that before. Oh yeah, yeah that's that's the, that's the famous and that's in I, I I'm not kidding you. I was in a revival meeting one time. <laughs> I was in a revival meeting. And they're like, "Where's my wife at? <laughs> She's hiding. <laughs> she probably signed for that song." Um, but uh, yeah, you remember you were there when they did that. You were there, Rachel. Were you? Yeah, that was funny. Revival of what? A revi it was a revival meeting, and they were comparing, like, the Statue of Liberty with the Bible. Was it the Bible or the cross? No, the cross. It was compared. The sta <laughs> Angela just lost it. She's like. <laughs> well, yeah, they compared the Statue of Liberty to the cross. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm like. This is why, look, this is why I don't get invited anywhere. This is why, this is why, because I say things like this, and nobody will ever have me anywhere, because <laughs> I say things like this. I remember one time I was invited to a 4th of July thing down in Iowa, and I preached um, that, that message on, um, I, I, the, do you guys remember the sermon I preached, the paganism of patriotism? No, <laughs> I, I did. Is that bad? I never got invited back. I don't think. Huh? Yeah. Oh, that was way before you were around. You were probably still in high school when I did that. You listen to that sermon? Okay. You were probably in high school when I preached that. Yeah, I don't know. How old are you? Hey, happy birthday yesterday. Wow. Nobody said happy birthday. Man. I did. I, I preached that at a church. But you know what? The pastor stuck up for me. He goes, now listen, you may have never heard anything like this before, but, you know, I, I'd encourage you to look into what he said. You know? I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't unkind about it, but I know, man, it was like crickets. <laughs> I made some people mad there. The fireworks were in the church. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but uh, anyway, it was, so uh, any, anyway, so they, they did the whole Statue of Liberty thing and all that kind of stuff, and, and uh, but uh, so Athens, Statue of Liberty, same thing, right? Same thing. What was Paul's reaction to all this? The Bible says his spirit was stirred within him. His spirit was stirred. He was stirred up. What does that mean? He, he was moved. He was agitated by it. He was put into action by it. It bothered him. Paul's intentions were to wait for backup, right? So Paul was going to wait for backup. He was like, all right, I better wait. I'm going to send for Timotheus. I'm going to send for Silas. And I'm not, I'm I'm not going to do anything until they get here because I'm here by myself. So Paul walks around, and he just walks through the city. You know, like you would, right? Like you would. You know, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything, right? I won't do anything. I'll just walk by. I'll eat some food. I'll hang out here for a little while, take a little break, wait for everybody else to show up. Well, then he walks around, and he sees the whole city wholly given to idolatry. And he's like, ah, and he can't take it. He can't take it, right? 
Paul's intentions were to wait, but he couldn't. His heart was so incredibly stirred within him that he had to open his mouth and begin disputing their nonsense and their superstitions and their outright foolishness. Jeremiah 20, verse 9, that reminds me of that, verse 9 through 11. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. Amen. Listen to what he says. For I heard the defaming of many. Fear on every side. Report, say they, and we will report it. All my familiars watch for my halting, saying, Peradventure he will be enticed, and we shall prevail against him, and we shall take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore my persecutors shall stumble, and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be, never be forgotten. You know, his heart was stirred up within him. Not at the marvelous Greek architecture of an amazing city, but the idols and the idolatry that, were, that their minds and hearts were fully given over to, that they were driven by what they worshipped. What he saw stirred his heart. It was like an instrument that had played, and his heart immediately reacted to it. Remember, Paul, he's that saved Jew. When he sees these Gentiles bowing down to statues and, and, and offering altars to these gods and everything else, he was moved by it. He was moved by their foolishness and their nonsense and how deceived Satan had them, that they were worshiping stones and stocks yeah. like people do with evolution. Yeah. They... Right? They, they worship the creature, they worship the creation, and not the creator. Same thing. I, I'm telling you, and I'll say it again to you, and you ought to remember this very, close, uh, very carefully, that evolution is beast worship. Amen. That is what it is. It's, it's worship of the beast. That is what it is. It is the end times Luciferian worship of the beast. That's what it is. Why do you think that everybody, even a Christian, is afraid to tell people? Uh, what congressman do you know or how many congressmen do you know will stand up and say, I absolutely 100% disagree with the foolish theory of evolution and I think it's nonsense and I think God created man and God spoke this world into existence. No, why? Because they'll be laughed out. They'll be embarrassed, right? They'll be ridiculed and mocked like you and I are. And I look at them and I say, well, you guys worship monkeys. So why should I feel bad? You can't make me feel stupid. Amen. You're saying you came from a cosmic fart. So how could I feel dumb? How could I ever feel stupid when that's where you came from? Amen. That's what you say. And I know it's crude. I'm sorry if your little precious ears can't handle it tonight. But listen to me. They're going to say a whole lot worse than that to you. Trust yeah. me. Amen. Whole lot worse than that to you. I can call it a lot of things if you want me to call it something different. But here's the truth of it. That's what they believe. That's how crazy people get. That's how insanity comes when you leave the truth of the scriptures. And you follow this nonsense. And Paul looks at you and says... You're all too superstitious. That's what happens. That's what happens right there. But you're trying to make me feel dumb because I don't believe your fairy tale. I really don't believe that. Yeah. Amen. Right? Yep. I don't believe your fairy tale. I, I, don't, I don't believe it. Right? But you're, but, but see, you can't let, you don't have to let people make you feel dumb like that. <laughs> it's like, of course they do. That, that's, that's what they enjoy doing. No, you don't. That's right. Remember, Paul, he saw all this. Paul was not some unrefined man, right? Paul understood things. He was very, very intelligent man. He was a very learned man. In the eyes of the world, he was educated better than most men. He didn't wish to observe the natives in their, 
ceremonies. You know, Paul wasn't there to go and admire the, like people going to India and be like, let me go to these temples and marvel at their beauty and everything. No, I don't, I don't marvel at their beauty. They're a bunch, Paul looked at them and said, man, they're a bunch of stinking pagans. Yeah. Half naked, run around, put some clothes on. What's the matter with you people? Mm-hmm. Right? Paul looked at it and, and he was disgusted by it. He was disgusted by their idolatry. Like, I know when, I, when, I'm on, when we're on vacation sometimes, you go to different places. Most of the time, I skip all the Indian stuff. You want to know why? Because all the Indian stuff is like ceremonial witchcraft and everything else, and they want me to watch their ceremonies. Like I had some Indian guy, uh, we were somewhere in Montana, was it Montana? And I was there, and some Indian guy uh, walked up and said, oh, you should come over to the reservation and do this and do that. I was like, nah, I'm good. I, I didn't say a whole lot to him, but I'm like, I just listened to what he was saying, and then I, I told my kid, no, we're not going over there. We're not going to do that. Why? Because they're a bunch of pagans. Yeah. yeah. It's a bunch of witchcraft, and you want me, I'm not mesmerized by your witchcraft. Like, I don't think it's cool for you to do a rain dance to the gods because, because you want rain to come down. Right. See, I think that's idolatry. Amen. Right? So I don't want to go watch you do that. I have no desire to go see you, see you in your native stuff and doing all your witchcraft. I don't, I don't want to watch you do your witchcraft. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's cool. I don't, oh, wow. I don't, I get, maybe I don't have enough of an artistic mind. I don't know. I don't appreciate different cultures. I don't appreciate different cultures like that. Just like I don't want to, I don't want to hear a bunch of African beats in the church house. I don't want to have a bunch of African tribal music in the church house and turning the church house into a rock concert and turn, I I don't want to see that. Why? Because you definitely right. I'm not cultured. I'm Christ centered and I don't want any part of that. I don't, the church isn't, isn't for that. We're not going to, we're not going to go about playing their rock and roll beats and their drums and everything else that they do. Right. And we're not going to, and, and you know, the other thing I'm not going to do, I'm not going to apologize to you about it. Amen. I'm not going to, I'm not going to apologize to you, but I'm not sorry. Amen. I'm not sorry about it. I have no remorse about not turning the church into some rock and roll concert with a bunch of naked women running around dancing and, and going like this and saying they feel the spirit and they feel one. All right. But it ain't the holy one. I don't want anything to do with that. We don't need that. And we don't want to be a part of any of that nonsense. Right. Paul was not, Paul saw that. He wasn't like taken by that. He saw him as utterly superstitious and deceived. Right? One, sa- one man said it this way. He said, when the soul is debauched by the worship of a false god, the body is abandoned to every species of corruption. Mm-hmm. And he listed his reference for that comment as Romans chapter 1. Oh. Makes sense, doesn't it? When the soul is debauched by the worship of a false god, the body is abandoned to every species of corruption. It's true. That's right. Right. I find it strikingly obvious when you visit state capitol buildings that they are modeled after Greek or Roman art. The big structures, the stone, uh, many of them are full of idols and false gods. But then you wonder why and you go to Washington, D.C. and you see them govern like a bunch of devils and you wonder why. Well, they're all worshiping devils. They're all surrounded by statues of devils. Right? Right? And they, and they all play mischievous games like a bunch of devils. Yes. I, I hate it so much. You, you want to know one of the most fakest guys ever in the whole world as a politician is the, is the head of the Republican Party right now, not Donald Trump, but Kevin McCarthy, the, the head of the House. That guy is so fake. The games those people play when they talk back and forth is like, literally, it is just like an episode that I watched when I was a kid of pro wrestling. There is no difference. These guys are a bunch of jokers. Only I watched so much pro wrestling that I'm like, I'm going to call it right there. This is what this guy's going to do. Because yeah. it's a scam. It's all, they're all fake. They, I'm telling you, these people are nothing but led by devils. They are fake. Yeah. They govern like devils and don't waste your time on them. Right. What's that? Talking suits. Talking suits. <laughs> right. Now I want you to think about the Vatican. In the name of art, how wholly given over to idolatry is the Roman Catholic Church.
Think about all the naked portraits, Lucifer's throne, uh, the worship of Peter's toe, the skeletons, the bones of men, the idols that are up everywhere, right? See the Vatican? Look at it. Think about that. That's, that's like a modern day representation of what Paul saw when he walked through there, right? That's what he saw. Could you imagine the apostle Paul walking through the Vatican? Right. The androgynous things that are there, all of all of the pervert, I mean, the openly satanic things, Luciferian things that are there. Yeah. Right. That's what Paul saw. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Have you felt that same stirring? I have. I know you have, too. When you hear men caught in such lies and caught in such foolishness and caught in sin and taken by the devil and they worship self or a God of their own making. Right. Sometimes we find ourselves in positions where we can't say what we'd like to to some people. Right. I think of a, yesterday this woman, we were coming back from picking up a, a dog kennel we bought a, off uh, somebody used and... You know, and and we stopped by. We were picking something up on the... Somebody had a hunting blind on the side of the road. They said the only reason why they got rid of the hunting blind is because he couldn't figure out how to fold it. So I said, I'll take it. So I grabbed it and stuck it in my truck. I don't know how to fold it either, but it fit in my trunk, so I just kept going. I didn't care. I'll figure it out later. Actually, I'll make my son figure it out, but somebody will figure it out. Anyway, but... Uh, so, but this lady, she was drunk and I could tell she was drunk and, and, you know, she, she had pulled up and she was trying to pick up this, this, this lawn bagger thing that this, this guy was giving away for free. And, and, um, she asked me if I could help her. I said, sure, I'll help you. And we, Hannah and I helped her get it up into the, into her truck and everything like that. And we talked to her and, and she said she was running around out there and, she worked out there. She's a farm girl. She's out there her whole life. She's probably like 50, you know, 45. She's probably 50, you know, maybe a little 55 even. And she was out there and she was pretty gone. And she said, yeah, I'm just out here running around, smoking a little pot and all this stuff. She goes, I got a card. She told me she had nine pins in her back from an accident that she had. She said everything in her back is fused together. Uh, she was telling us just a bunch of things that she had wrong. I felt bad for her. And I, you know, I wanted to say something to her, you know. And she said she was in pain constantly. I, you know, it's pretty bad, she said. She goes, I, and I, she said, I, I smoked that instead of taking the pain pills that they wanted to give me. And I didn't really have time to say a whole lot to her. We gave her a track and, uh, and we'll probably see her again. She's not that far from out there from where we are. But, to, but you know, here's a lady that is dead in trespasses and sins, right? And she's in pain. And no doubt, I believe she is in pain. I don't think she's lying about it. I mean, nine pins in your back, you're probably in some pain, right, Aaron? And, uh, you know, and she's, you know, tore up everywhere. You know, her body is. And, and uh, but, you know, th those people need hope. They need the Lord. Right? So I understand what Paul meant by being stirred to want to talk to people, right? Yeah. About that. You know, or when you hear men's worship run contrary to the scriptures and the Holy Ghost bears witness with his word, and you're like, man, that's not right. What you're saying is not right. That's not biblical, right? That's not worship of the Lord. We have to be careful that you and I may not be guilty of worshiping idols. You know, we don't worship idols. We might we don't worship idols of gold, but we might worship the gold from the idols. Right? We would never bow down and worship idols of gold, but we might worship the gold. Right? The Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. We have to be careful not to get caught up in materialism, that we don't get caught up in everything, right? That we don't get caught up in this world and, and having to have everything the world has and all that. That's, you know, we... We could, we could definitely fall for that, couldn't we? Right. I mean, we have to make sure that we're careful. You know, America is full of a lot of vices, just like Athens was. Think about it. Think about the idols and vices of America, the liquor trafficking, the porn industry, the Hollywood industry, the sports industry. 
Think about the wholesale slaughter of babies in America and entire industries that are built, billions of dollars of industry built on killing babies. I mean, you think Paul would be less stirred by America? Right? When he walked in and he saw the things of America and, and what's going on here and the slaughter of babies. I mean, millions and millions of babies being murdered. Right? Think about that. What are they murdered on? They're murdered on the altar. They're slaughtered on the altar of career and convenience. Yes. Most abortions are due to career and convenience. That's what most of them are due to. They're not due to anything else, really. Wow. I'd be furious too. Wow. A friend of he said a friend of his, or a person that's working with him said that his girlfriend girlfriend or wife his fiance went into the uh, hospital to take a test because she thought that she was with child and they told her yes you are how do you want to get rid of it? Man, it's hard not to want to punch somebody in the face like that. I mean, it just is really, isn't it? I, I, I mean, I'm, t I'm just speaking, speaking honest with you. I know that's not, that don't sound very nice, but I'm going to tell you what. Somebody looked at me and said that. I don't know. I mean, that would make me want to. Well, why, why don't we harvest your lung tissue? Yeah, exactly. It's pretty sick. It's pretty sick, isn't it? That's right. Sort of. No. But think about it this way also. Even before that, though, birth control sold by the millions yes. of pills a day. And why? So men and women can fornicate like dogs in the streets and not be responsible for yes. it. Amen. Right? But now we're seeing generations of children. I'm talking to them, generations of women now that were on orthotricycline and other, other uh, birth controls, and they can't get pregnant. They want to have babies now, and they can't. Their hormones are changing. I've got a, a family member that, are, that, that, that her hair is falling out. And now, now she wants to have a baby. But she was on orthotricycline for probably 10 years. Right? Think about that. What is that? due to idolatry and self-worship. But you know what? We need, we need to ask God for grace to bring these lost sinners the gospel, to give them the truth, to help them to come to Christ, right? We don't need more money to do this. We don't need more time to do this. We don't need more machinery to do this. We need more heart to do this. We need more of the Holy Ghost stirring in our hearts to get out and preach more, to preach to more of our neighbors and our families and to those that, that wherever they live, everywhere, right? To have our hearts stirred up. Whole cities given over to idolatry, right? Paul walked up and down this great city and his heart was so stirred by the absolute idolatry that he saw and ours should be. Again, it was estimated that there were over 30,000 public idols in Athens, not counting the private ones. It was said that it was easier to find a God in Athens than a man. Think about that. This is a situation Paul finds himself in. And what's Paul going to do? Well, next week we're going to find out. We're done. But he's going to dispute. And he's going to dispute some different groups. And we have to look at those groups and who they are and who he's talking to and how he talks to them and what he explains to them and why he uses that method of evangelism that he uses on these, on these men, which is far different than what he used in other places. There was a reason for it, right, that he used that. And then you're, we're going to find him being taken to a council and, and, and brought, remember, brought before kings, brought before counselors, brought before governors to witness, right? To be a witness for the Lord, just like you and I may be, right? Amen. Brought before these, these people. But so now you get an understanding, I hope a little bit better, of an understanding of what 
Paul saw when he walked into Athens. Amen. Right? So now you understand from here on out where he's headed and what's going to happen. You know, this, I will tell you this, in the eyes of man or in the eyes of, if we're keeping track of numbers and things of that nature, this was not the most successful stop for Paul. It was probably one of the most vexing stops for him that he had. And to my knowledge and everything that I've seen, he never planted a church there. It was one of the places he could never, the, Satan had such a stronghold in that area. And God never allowed it. Mm-hmm. All that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you have Bickle and those other people. No, not Bickle. What's what's the name of the guy there? Yeah, Mike Bickle. Is, and yeah, and you have them in that concentrated I was area. There, and, and I went to the. I actually walked through an event that they were holding, where they had all their prophets together in the old IHOP building. Wow. Prophets building, and there was probably three thousand people there, flopping around, gibbering, doing all kinds of weird. And I walked through and just filmed it and walked right out and got in the car with my buddy and left. Wow. And we went and watched it. We were just like, this is astounding. <laughs> right in that city, too. Mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Yep. So Paul's going to face the philosophers next week. He's going to deal with all of them, and he's going to bring them back to the gospel, round of the gospel. He's going to bring them to the truth and uh, deal with them. So we're going to see that. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your word. And thank you, Lord, for the truth. And Lord, help us to live it every day of our lives. Help us to be a witness. Lord, there's so many people out there that are deceived, lost, dead in sins, caught up in idolatry and false worship and even evolution and beast worship and everything else, Lord. May we preach the gospel to them, Lord, and may your Holy Spirit work in their hearts and their lives and bring them to a place of repentance and faith in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.